to this morning to say thank you for allowing us to sit up there, dear Heavenly Father. Yeah. Yeah. Heavenly Father, I come to you as your loyal and faithful steward, dear Heavenly Father. Dear Heavenly Father, use me as you see fit, dear Heavenly Father. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that your word falls fresh on me, dear Heavenly Father, and as you preach your word this morning, dear Heavenly Father, and it falls fresh on fresh soil, dear Heavenly Father. Dear Heavenly Father, bless this congregation, dear Heavenly Father. The officer is the only father that's pastor and his lovely family, dear Heavenly Father. Yeah, and minister and his family as well, dear Heavenly Father. And also bless my family, dear Heavenly Father. Dear Heavenly Father, once again, we just want to say thank you. Thank you. For just being God and God all by itself. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. verses 1 through 8. And it reads, But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, that the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, and in patience. The older women likewise that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not given too much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the young women to love their husbands. Right. I'm gonna repeat that, y'all might have missed that. <laughs> that they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, Chase, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemy. Likewise, exhort the young men to be sober-minded in all the things showing yourself to be pattern of good works and doctrine showing integrity, reverence, incorruptibility, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that one who is an opponent may be ashamed, have not evil to say of you. And God bless the hearers and the doers of his word. Amen. Amen. This morning, the subject is going to be Monkey see, monkey do. <laughs> now, if you don't mind, I'm going I'm, I'm to teach a little bit this morning as well as preach. Amen? Amen. Like I said, I'm coming from the book of Titus. Now, Titus was a, a Greek believer, taught and nurtured by Paul. He stood before the leaders of the church in Jerusalem as a living example 
of what Christ was doing among the Gentiles. Like Timothy, he was one of Paul's trusted traveling companions and closest friends. Later, he became Paul's special ambassador and eventually the overseer of the churches on Crete. Slowly and carefully, Paul developed Titus into a, a mature Christian and a responsible leader. There was a letter written by Paul to Titus, just giving instructions on how to organize and, and lead the churches. Church teachings must relate to various groups. Older Christians were to teach and to be examples to younger men and women. People of every age and group have a lesson to learn and a role to play, amen? amen. As adults, we have to be mindful of what we do and say because one thing we need to realize is that the youth will one day be in our position. And for the church to grow, we have to teach them the right Christian way. Now, now, brothers and sisters, we have to know our role. Having people of all ages in the church makes it strong. But also having people of all ages in the church has the potential for problems as well. Paul gave Titus counsel on how to help various groups of, of people. Now, the, the old people should teach the younger people by words and example. Right. This is how values are passed from one generation to generation. This is how it was meant to be. But a lot of people, or a lot of older people, some, not all, got the youth thinking it's okay to be disrespectful, lazy, thinking they grown because that's, that's how they treat them, amen? amen? Now what we need to realize is that our, our youth, that they are very impressionable. A lot of things that we do and say are because of or what they do and say is because of what we do and say. And trust me, adults are very impressionable as well. On other adults, you know, see that's, that's what I call the, the monkey see, monkey do syndrome. As a child, This is still something that we all did. You know, mocking our friends, wanting them to do as we did when we were coming up. You know, and if you didn't pay them any attention, sometimes it would just get worse. You know, but you will always get that, that one kid, no matter how annoying the other kid was, you know, sometimes they just go on like they weren't even there. You know, not trying to fall into that trap. See, when we when we don't get that attention that we're seeking, then a lot of times we pull out all the stops. Doing any and everything to get a rise out of that person. But you know, the funny part is, you know, when they see that that you don't care, or you, you, you got better things to do, they'll just move on. See, they let you know that all they're trying to do is get to get your attention and they just want you to do what they're doing as well. Amen? Amen. You know? And then a lot of times they'll just move on, you know, to the next person, interact with them, go on with everything that they're saying and doing as well. And I know that, that we all remember, you know, kids like that, you know, just got on your nerves, you know, <laughs> all the time. All right. But what if I told you that we're talking about adults here instead of kids. Mm. See, it's about being mature. And as adults, most of us are not mature spiritually. And we have a tendency to act as such, like kids, or acting like uh, what, what, what you call the Pharisees. You know, wanting people to believe what they believed in, wanting people to lean on their every word, but instead of calling them Pharisees, now they, they call them church cliques. Yeah. Everybody's stroking each other's ego within that clique. And so it's that monkey see, monkey do syndrome again. Now. 
And brothers and sisters, you know, as we look at, I'm going to go down to verses 1 through 5, and it states, but as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine, that the older men be sober, reverent, temperate, sound in faith, in love, and patience. The older women likewise, that they be reverent in behavior, not slanderers, not giving too much wine, teachers of good things, that they admonish the young men to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, and obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Now many of these characters could be under the heading of, of self-control. Now self-control was an important aspect in early Christianity. The Christian community, community excuse me, was made up of people from differing backgrounds and viewpoints, making conflict inevitable. Christians existed in a heathen and often hostile world. To stay above reproach, men and women needed wisdom of discernment to be discreet and to master their wills, tongues, and pain passions so that Christ would not be dishonored. Now it states here in Ephesians 5.22, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Submitting to, to another person is an often misunderstood concept. It doesn't mean that, that you should become like a doormat or a puppet for someone else's gain. Christ, at whose name that every knee should bow, of those in heaven, on the earth, and under the earth, submitted to his will, to the Father, and we honor Christ by following his example. Amen. When we submit to God, we become more willing to obey his command, to submit to others, that is to subordinate our rights to theirs. Amen. Basically, that's saying putting others before yourself. Right. In a marriage relationship, both husband and wife are called to submit. Let me, let me go back. Hold on. In, let me make sure I'm reading this right. In a marriage relationship, both a husband and wife are called to submit. For the wife, this means willingly following her husband's following that it's not about the church anymore. And a lot of people, you know, if they come to church, it's always about the negative. The keeps is coming back. Uh, the, the, the drama. What's going on in the choir this week? Yeah, you know, what, I know I have. What the pastor, the minister, has said this week. What's going on with the deacons? You know, it's, it's always something going on to the, the church that I keep the person coming back. It's not the word. You know, it's not the fact that yeah, the choir blowing the roof off the joint. You know, it's, it's always drama that draws you back. And see, Paul urged Titus to be to be a good example to those around him so that others might see Titus' good work and imitate him. Paul's life gave his words greater impact. If you want someone to act a certain way, be sure that you live that way yourself. Amen? Amen. Now, then you will earn the right to be heard, maybe. You know, but your life will reinforce what you teach. That's right, that's right. See, brothers and sisters, we know we gotta we gotta get away from, from that syndrome, you know, and start setting standards or some standards that is pleasing to God. And you know, and I said, you know, and I tell you earlier, I'm I'm pretty short and I'm straight to the point. You know, I, I give what God gives. Amen. You know, I'm not a procrastinator. So I get ready to take my seat. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just want to say that, that Paul counseled Titus to be, you know, above criticism. You know, and how he how he taught. This quality of integrity comes from careful, careful Bible study and listening before you speak. If we are impulsive, unreasonable, and confusing, we are likely to start arguments rather than to convince people of the truth. 
Swing on. Like I said, I'm, I'm real quick with it. All right. You're ready to take my seat. I'm going to just tell you about a friend of mine that's not confused. That's not impulsive, unreasonable, and that's our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen? There's no confusion when he wakes me up in the morning. No confusion when I'm fed, clothed, sheltered, able to get up and walk and talk. See, a lot of us get confused, but it's not about what we want, how we want it, or when we want it. It's when he wants it, how he wants it, and how God Walton. Amen. Now, as we all, before I take my seat, I just want to remind you of one thing. The only people mad about you for speaking the truth are those that's living a lie. Amen. And God bless. text that uh, uh, Pastor uh, Harris mentioned about the older men and the older women teaching the younger men and the younger women. Uh, I want to share something with you from Judges chapter 2. I'm not going to preach again, but there's something that we need to just look at. In Judges chapter 2, verse 8 it says, And Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died, being 110 years old. And they buried him in the board of his inheritance in Timna Harris in the Mount of Ephraim, on the north side of, of the hill of Gash. And verse 10 says this, And also all that generation were gathered up unto their fathers, and there arose another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the works which he had done for Israel. So just tying in with the message that Mr. Harris has preached, if one generation does not teach the next, they will grow up and they will not know Christ. And to, to see how plain the Bible lays this out for the older women to teach younger women. And younger women will teach the children. This keeps breaks from occurring in the generational gaps. We wonder why so many people in society now seem to be so far away from the law. Well, it's obvious. Somewhere in the lineage, someone failed to talk about Jesus. Amen. And if we neglect the responsibility that the Bible clearly lays out for us, you will have another generation come up that will know nothing about Christ. Amen. They won't know how to treat one another. They won't love like the Bible says to love. They won't respect the dogs like the Bible says they're supposed to. It's right here in the text, and we can see it happening now. So I thank you, preacher, for that message. Because it reminds us that we, we don't retire from instruction. If, if we got mothers in the church, the mothers in the church need to talk to the younger women in the church. And the younger women in the church set the example for the young lady, the young girl, teenagers in the church. And as they begin to live Christ like their, their siblings will see them doing what's right. It continues on. It's a process that continues on from generation to generation. And if the ball is ever dropped, there will be those that come up that know nothing about the Lord. 
So we thank God for the word on this morning. Come on, let's praise God for the prayer. Reminding us of our Christian duty. It's more to it than just being saved. We thank God for salvation. But we were saved to go work for the Lord. And that work, it, it, it starts in the home. This, this ties right into what we've just been discussing in our discipleship training. You know, we teach our children. They teach their children. They teach their children. You do know that's how we heard the gospel. It started with the apostles, and it made its way down through time. And at some point, all of us in here that are saved, we heard the message, and we were convicted, and we said yes to the Lord. And just in case there's someone here this morning who has not said yes to the Lord, today is a great day for you to give your life to the Lord after hearing the message. We heard about Christ. We know that there's a responsibility to all of us. Someone has been contemplating on your decision. There's no better time than right now to give your life to the Lord. If you're here this morning and you feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit, you can come by letter, Christian experience, or a candidate for baptism. But all the Lord wants you to do is come. Would there be one? Oh, oh, oh. 